Good morning. My name is Sarah Gorham. I am a registered practitioner here at Light on the Mountains, and I would like to invite all of us to just take this moment to center in your heart and to know in the fullness of your being that the divine is present in all things. It is present in this gathering, it is present in this moment, in this day, in this expression of spring, in the energy of connection between us all. It is what expresses through us, which gives us life, and which gives us joy. And so from that place of realization, I bless this gathering. I give thanks for all who participate to make it happen, from Narda, who is behind the scenes, making her technology magic work for us, to RL, his perfect music, his wise words, for Terry and the rest of the leadership council, for Reverend John and his guidance and leadership throughout the week and his words today. I give thanks for all of this. I realize it all as an expression of the divine and know that it is perfect and a miracle. And so together we acknowledge this and together we say, and so it is. So, um, as I was telling the little cluster of people gathered here this morning, I was originally going to write something more sort of reflective and maybe in line with what John wrote about in his blog, but I got a case of spring fever yesterday. So, this is what came out. <clears throat> Today is a day that we change our clocks and spring forward. In another week, we will reach the spring equinox, and in a sure sign that the season has changed and spring has truly arrived, the bike path has been plowed. Spring. Think of that word and all the energy potential in it, just waiting to be released. Consider all the various meanings of that word, both verb and noun, all imply a burst of energy released into the world. A spring, a coiled wire under tension that pushes outward and upward. Water that bubbles up from the ground of its own accord. The verb to spring, to pounce or leap. And of course, the miracle season where new life bursts forth everywhere. When spring arrives, Everything is on the move. Tiny shoots poke their noses out of seemingly barren soil. Buds swell and tender leaves emerge from the naked twigs of winter. In dens and burrows everywhere, babies are born into the rising warmth of the new season. It is all such a miracle, but such an everyday miracle that we often fail to be gobsmacked by the wonder of it all. So it should have been an obvious fact to me my entire life, I have recently been stunned by the realization that plants make themselves out of seemingly nothing. The most gargantuan redwood tree, so towering and enormous that its lowest branches are 40 feet above the ground, starts with a tiny seed and builds itself entirely out of water, air, sunlight, and some micronutrients from the soil. How does it do that? How do you get something as solid and substantial as wood rising high into the sky from such ephemeral building blocks? It is a wonder and a miracle, and it happens around us every day. Remember Jack and the Beanstalk and the Magic Beans? When you think about it, every seed is a magic bean. A bit of miracle packed with some operating instructions and the mystery of the life force. A tiny packet of potential waiting to spring forward and perform its magic trick for all to behold. This happens all around us every year as surely as the snow belts melts and the temperatures rise. Little miracles of creation and invitations to wonder. But alas, Part of the wonder of this miracle is that we often fail to wonder at the miracle. We give the whole hum treatment to that which should astound and delight. We allow its everywhere presence to dull us to the stunning performance piece that is creation, where the upwelling of source pours over us and manifests all around us. 
that we need not be so mindless of the miracle. We can instead be a more attentive and appreciative audience, an out loud and observant one. We can give a standing ovation as the waking earth unfurls its bright green banner. We can say yes to the planting of seeds on our knees and in appropriate reverence. We can sing our praises to the birds who gather in the treetops and with no prompting whatsoever sing for all of us. And we can be still and offer our silent prayers of gratitude for the miracles and blessings that emerge everywhere. Embracing us in this wild demonstration of divine love and creation that we simply call life. Happy spring. Hope everybody is celebrating it. And so our affirmation for today in English and in Spanish, I shall try. I express the perfection of spirit in me, as me, and through me. In everything I do. Yo expreso la perfección del Espíritu dentro de mí, como mí, y a través de mí, en todo lo que hago. Hey. Good morning, John. Good morning. Hi. So, um, congratulations to those of you who are viewing this live. You passed the set the clock test uh, this morning. Uh, I suspect, even though I haven't checked yet, that there might be fewer of us live than in normal mornings, but that's the way it is. So, again, it, it's not actually spring yet, but I think I've got spring fever too. Just like it's spring, it, it's spring ish, and going outside in the middle of the day without a jacket or, or something, it, it's great. So, anyways, what do we want to talk about today? So, I have been watching a TV series on the Apple channel. It's a special subscription you have to get uh, to subscribe to called For All Mankind. And I knew very little about it when I went in to watch it. All I knew was that it um, started its story in the late 1960s and around the Apollo missions, you know, trip to the moon and all that. And um, it sounded like it'd be great. Uh, even though it was fiction, it would, in my mind, it would be a revisiting of some great moments in our history. And the first uh, episode began exactly as I thought it was. So the first landing on the moon was in July of 1969. And if you were alive then, you know where you were. Really, you knew where you were. I knew where I was as a 12 year old boy. You were glued to a TV set somewhere, weren't you? And it showed on this episode how people across our country and the world were glued to TV sets. You might be in a pub or um, at a place of work that would never have a TV set in it. Believe me, at that day, there were TV sets everywhere, and it seemed like the earth stopped for a few moments. It was a big, amazing thing. And, and of course, coming to that moment in this first episode where... Neil Armstrong is going to come down the ladder and, and plant his fat flag and say what he's going to say. But here's what I didn't know about this, this series. It's what they call an alternate history series. That it's not going to happen the way you think. In fact, it's going to happen differently and kind of see where history goes in another direction. So the big moment, astronaut on the ladder coming down, the camera comes back, and it's a Soviet cosmonaut planting a hammer and sickle flag on the moon as the first man on the moon. And I know this is fiction, but even now when I told you that, didn't you get a little gut punch? It's like, wait a second, this is one of the most iconic moments in our history as Americans, and in this show, it didn't happen. And Hardy was like, I'm just going to turn this TV off. I just don't like where this is going. Um, now, in this alternate history, two weeks later, Neil Armstrong does make his landing on the moon. And in this fiction, the Soviets had their secret, top secret moon landing plan. And they just, the day of, it was two weeks before the Neil Armstrong, says, guess what? We're landing on the moon today. So, again, I'm like getting sick to my stomach thinking about it. Because it's not the way it was supposed to be. And you think, this is terrible. We lost the Cold War. Horrible things are happening here. But then the story started to unfold. 
So part of, it, in our, of our lives, and as we're looking at our spiritual path, you say, what's good? What's bad? Sometimes what was good seems to be bad, and what was bad seems to be good. And how can I make these judgments? So as this series you know, develops, I'm not quite done with the full, I think, 20 episodes yet. So in our history, we ended at Apollo 17, and we haven't done much since, at least in the way of the moon. Um, but somehow, the Soviets landing in this fictional version kind of set a fire under us as a country to do more in space. Um, as the series progresses, we, of course, stopped at Apollo 17 in the series. It went up to Apollo 30-something. That, I think, on the second or third um, Russian landing on the moon, they um, showed that, surprise again, the cosmonaut is female. And the fire was lit under NASA like, oh, I guess we just can't give lip service to including women in this. We have to actually send a woman to the moon in, in this story like 1970. Shortly after that, there's a permanent moon base on the moon that's always occupied by both male and female astronauts. And they're truly and seriously at the point I'm in thinking, you know, next shot has got to be, we got to think about Mars. So which history is better? I mean, really, which is better? You think, can, can we, if we could have number two version, door number one or number two, can we give up the ego attachment to it being first to, in a sense, have a longer-lasting program basis on the moon, female astronauts that are fully integrated into the program? Interesting. And, of course, another fun thing, if you if you watch this, is that they're always throwing a little, like to say, Easter egg thing. So in the background, there'll be a, a news program going, and there'll be a little bit else, an alternate history thing that happened. So just a few, you know, just kind of fun. That you, that they don't say announcement, we're going to announce something that's different that you don't know about. It's just that little thing or a newspaper like, oh, um, you know, Teddy Kennedy elected for president instead of Jimmy Carter. We're, you know, just little things like that that are kind of fun. But I think it's good for us in this point in history to ask ourselves what's good, what's bad, what's our judgment on it. And, of course, watching this series this last couple of weeks have coincided with our one-year, I guess, anniversary, you're going to call it, of, um, of our pandemic. Um, and, of course, all the issues are coming up. Is it good? Is it bad? It, it, is, it almost sounds sacrilegious to say, well, it could be good. Well, like, there's a lot of things that I'm not willing to say that are good, but what, what will be the, the long view of history? Historians 50, 60, 70 years from now, as they look back, will it be a time they say, you know, it was really pretty bad, but it sure made this shift into a different direction that we wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for that shift. I'm, I, I'm hoping for that. And, and so as we even now look at this, and, and we're thinking now of kind of coming out of it, hopefully, that there's you know, green shoots of, of spring, so to speak. But still, you know, so, we're, so much has happened in this last year, beyond even the pandemic, the issues that it's, it's brought up, the, the just the, the difficult political climate and um, family member, and I'm not speaking to other family members, and it, it just seems like all this stuff has come up. It's just like another perfect analogy, especially if you live more South Valley right now, if your snow has melted on your lawn, what stuff was underneath there? You know, snow we've got quite a bit, but that's usually, it always amazes me. And in the past, uh, uh, my dog always was very excited with spring because there was amazing things, lots of yummy, tasty things that would make her kind of like, you know, lose it underneath the snow. So what's the things that are, what has been looking and part of this, of course, the bigger thing of what opportunities for spiritual growth has this presented to us? And that's a question that I don't know if we can quite even answer yet. But as we answer that, of course, it, it, we look for simple answers to complex questions, I think, as human beings. Uh, we like to say something like, oh, this whatever was sent to us because of this, and, and kind of go, you know, airy fairy, you know, Pollyanna white lighter of all oh, this is just whatever it is and it's amazing and it's good. But 
And again, you can't really judge of why it was here. And we certainly can't judge or determine how it got here. In fact, I think we spend too much time with so many things of trying to point a finger of how something got there rather than realizing, well, it's here. However it got here, it's here. And it's not so much to say, well, gee, what can I learn from it? But what do we have to do now with this thing that has landed in our, in our life? And I think that has been the ongoing question. What do we need to do now? And in a sense, what is our spiritual growth through here is difficult as it, it is. Um, and I think it's, it's certainly shown us that we like to think that spiritual growth is fun and enjoyable. It is sometimes. Sometimes it's not. So what is it about? Now, as I wrote in my blog this week, we, we often think of spiritual growth as a matter of, of addition, that our, the circumstances in our life is proof that we are successfully growing in consciousness. That, you know, for that centuries, if not millennium, in different religions and, and spiritual paths, there's always been this idea that um, if things went bad, you know, the crops failed or something, the gods were mad at you and you did something bad. And, of course, if the crops were great or you have things flowing in your life, of course, the gods are, are really thinking great things about you and sending gifts along the way that you have, have shown the, the, the proper deference and, and worship and all that sort of thing. And we're still doing that on some level. And especially what we call new thought or metaphysics or science of mind, there's still this kind of almost elitist thing of, of well, I have so many additions in my life. That's certainly proof of my higher consciousness. And I've heard many people, you know, even some of my colleagues would say, I'm a really good manifester. I know how to work spiritual principles. And boy, we are really, you know, not making it here. And, and I did my spiritual work and treatment work. And boy, there was just that, that surprise check that came in the mail. And not to say that that stuff isn't good. Or not to say that being in a flow of life does not bring nice things into your life. But spiritual growth is not just about additions. In fact, I think the phrase of we make it about prince, princesses, palaces, and parking spaces. That, you know, I make a vision board or something, and, you know, prince and princesses, I attract the right person in my life that I've been looking forever, you know. And, and of course, you never go back to that person six months later to ask them, how's it going? Um, and then, palaces, not just places to live, but we, we say, of, oh, I have these amazing things that, that came in my life, and it shows that I'm working the principles really well. And then we even take it to the ridiculous point of parking spaces of, you know, I, I'm driving around our market Atkinson's in the height of the summer when there's, I don't know, umpteen million tourists in towns, and boom, there was a parking spot, and that shows that I'm in the flow of life. And we very smugly get in there and say, well, where did you park? Oh, sorry, you had to walk three blocks. That's a shame. I'll say a prayer for you. But that's not really what it's about, so to speak. Again, though, if our life appears to be working well and in a flow, I think it does say that we are being, we are connected to a certain extent. But it also is looking at how are you flowing with life when things aren't seemingly going well. That when you have a life-threatening disease, or we're in a world economy right now that's kind of teetering on the edge as we're stimulating it and hoping we can make it through until jobs can get back to normal sort of thing. So, as Michael Beckwith has said, 100% of spiritual growth is about letting go or about subtractions. So thinking about subtractions is not nearly as much fun, is it? Thinking about what am I carrying now that I have to make a conscious effort to release? What is it that I am just holding on here in the heart of my being that I am tripping over every time I try to get to an addition, so to speak? Or I have an addition and I get so messed up because... I haven't done the proper subtractions yet. And again, it, it, 
We don't like subtraction so much. We have to think about it. We have to do a deep spiritual practice in looking at them. That we are frustrated because intellectually we might have, in fact, I think many of us know exactly what it is, it is that we need to let go and subtract, but yet it seems to be almost this impossible thing. It's like, yeah, I know, that's my issue. And I've been acknowledging it for 30 years. I need to subtract it, and I, I, I'm not really sure how to do it or, or what is that process. Is there an easy three-step thing I can go to a self-help book and do it? Yeah, I mean, it's it just it's not as fun as as additions, is it? And you know, I mean, back to our, our our current state of history of is it good? Is it bad? What do I have to learn? I think it has, just like the melting snow, brought up the things that we really need to look at to now subtract the discord that has come up. And, um, and how do we deal with that right now? That you can't just, as we get this growing excitement that there seems to be in the air that we are moving forward finally with this. That, in fact, we were talking this morning of who we were going to get together with and all those sort of things and, and actually go to, you know, restaurants indoors and just those little additions that can happen. But we have to take a step back and say, well, what are we individually and collectively carrying? How do we, in a sense, engage with it in a healthful way, in a way that I'm not obsessing with it or standing in my own corner with my own ideas and opinions, but but how can I engage them and those difficult things through other people that I seem to be in conflict with? That as exciting as it may be as we're talking about opening plans and doing things that we haven't done for a while, that in a sense you can't put new paint over an old wallpaper. We still, as we are doing these great additions, need to spend more than a moment about, okay, what has this brought up? What within me do I really need to, right now, do some serious work? And in a sense, how do I engage and not, in, and not engage in an unhealthful way? Yeah, it's so interesting, like so many of you, as I go online and go on social media, you know, I'll go to this post and it's almost like this explosion <laughs> of, of discord and, and conspiracy theories and people are this this and that and the other. And, and it's just like, you know, and, and there's that, that the temptation to engage on that level. And whenever you see a post on that anywhere on the internet, social media, otherwise there's, you know, then... 30 responses, that is the opposite opinion, but at the same level of discord and dissatisfaction and just anxiety. So part of this is how do you engage but not engage like that. I came across a quote uh, this week by Nelson Mandela that I have seen not just dozens of times, hundreds of times, and I would guarantee and most of you, many of you have seen this at some point over the last several years. And he says, as I walked out of the door towards the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. Now, we loved to make larger-than-life figures out of someone like Nelson Mandela. Say, so, well, someone like that, he can do that. He can leave all that stuff behind as, as he leaves the prison doors. But real people don't do that, do they? Only these huge, iconic figures that are practically, you know, this far away from being a Jesus or a Buddha can do that sort of thing. But I, I think we should make people out like him to be somehow such ascended masters that what they did is not available to us. And I don't know this, but when I have thought of this over the years, this is kind of a story I've created myself, within myself. Something tells me that as he walked out of prison, you know, after being um, wrongly in prison for 26 years, you know, that's a long time. Something tells me that as he walked out, he just didn't skip out of there going, I'm completely done. 
with this. I've completely let it go. I've completely put it behind me. This is the bitterness and hatred. I've completely, it's clear, it's clean. I would imagine, since he is a human being or was a human being like the rest of us, that he had to revisit that commitment on a regular basis. I would probably not only have to revisit something like that on a daily basis, but on an hourly, you know, set my, my watch alarm kind of thing to continually go back. Because, I mean, just think about that. Again, we, we set him up as, as a hero, and rightfully so. But, again, think of wherever you are in your life right now, whatever age, subtract 26, the amount of time he was in prison. And just go back in your mind how old you were 26 years ago and imagine that from that moment to now you had been unlawfully in prison. And today you finally get out. What did you miss? What have missed in the last 26 years? I mean, it would be devastating. It would be for me. I would have, it has to be for all of us. So yet to make this statement, and again, I, I just really believe you probably had to constantly remind himself. And I think, in a sense, that's what we have to do. That we know what it is that we are carrying to a certain extent. And we have to continually remind ourselves that it's time. Our current history has shown us that it's time that some of the petty things that we've created within ourselves and with family members and people who are, quote, unquote, the other to us, that it's time to, again, set your alarm clock every 10 minutes to revisit. It's time to leave it behind. I just want to leave one thing with you, uh, written by someone named Rebecca Ray, and I'm assuming she's some sort of psychoanalyst, and she's talking about letting go. She says, it almost sounds poetic, doesn't it? Let it go. Letting go. Let go. Despite how it sounds, there's no part of letting go that is easy. If there was, I wouldn't be asked how to do it at least a handful of times per week. If it were easy, I would have a set of neatly boxed instructions for you. A list of those obvious things that you assume everyone must know but you. The secret to letting go and moving on that you must have missed somewhere between your parental and academic influences growing up. I'm sorry, I really am, because I'm not about to. Di- I'm about to disappoint you with the lack of instructions to follow. But you went on to say, letting go does not mean getting over it. It's a definition thing, and I can promise you that my personal and professional definition includes nothing about getting over the thing. Sure. Some things are short and less intense in their impact. They lose their capitalization after a while to simply become things that were once a part of us and are now not. But they are not the things that we need to let go. Those things are scar-making, memory-shaping, path-creating things. They stay with us, not to be forgotten. Letting go means acknowledging that we do not get over them, but instead we take them with us without being beholden to them. So it's about releasing our attachment. So in this wonderful air of spring, let's just take this within. And knowing that the presence of the divine that is right with us, right where we are, is that source that allows us to let go. In a sense, not get over, but not be attached to, not be controlled by what has happened. But to know that these are things that just happened. That we can rise above as our spiritual selves. Knowing that we are all connected. Knowing that as we face wonderful additions in our lives in the coming months, that we also follow the sacred paths of subtractions. Knowing that it is the perfect balance of life on earth. So I give thanks for this. And as I give my thanks for this, I release my attachment to these words, knowing that as I release attachment and let them go, that they have a life of their own, and amazing things happen. And so it is.